Hello, BYU fans. Welcome into another edition of VoiceOver with Greg and Shep. He's Greg Rubel. I'm Jason Shepard, and we are so happy to have our guest today. He is an NBA Draft Insider. He is the host of Chad Ford's NBA Big Board podcast. And if that wasn't enough, he's also an associate professor at BYU Hawaii. Chad Ford joining us here. Chad, first and foremost, thank you so much for taking some time. And uh, how are things in Hawaii right now? Well, they're like everywhere else in the world uh, right now, which isn't usually what you can say about Hawaii. I'm actually from my office here at BYU Hawaii with probably not another soul within <laughs> 500 feet uh, from here. It's very, very quiet. But, you know, we, the, the rule when you live in Hawaii is that you can never complain about living in Hawaii. So even during COVID-19, no complaints. Chad, I'm, I'm sure a lot of Cougar fans are aware, but uh, the undergraduate portion of your academic journey began at BYU in Provo and ended at BYU there in Laie. It did, yeah. I served my, uh, I went my freshman year at BYU in Provo, then I left and served a two-year mission uh, for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in San Bernardino, California. And upon return, I decided, you know what, I just want to take a little bit of a hiatus go to BYU Hawaii, enjoy the beach. And I just fell in love with the place. I, I, I just loved it so much. I, I never came back and ended up graduating from, from here with my undergrad degree. It obviously so, turned into a lot more. Yeah, yeah. And then I came back really about 10 years later. I graduated in 95 and came back 10 years later to be a professor here. I really wanted to raise my family here and just absolutely love it. Well, and you have, you have a great title. It's a very long title at BYU Hawaii. Why don't you tell everybody what your actual, you're, you're the director, you're an associate professor. Why don't you give everybody your title? Yeah, I know that this is really weird because I think most people know me from the NBA stuff and wonder all the time what the heck's going on. I just wrote a book about conflict resolution, dangerous love, and I get so many confused people on Twitter like, wait, wait, what, did, what are you doing like in two years? It, it's, it's much longer. Yeah, I, I am. Um, I'm the director of the David O. McKay Center for Intercultural Understanding, and it's a very unique uh, position in, in the BYUs because BYU Hawaii was founded by David O. McKay, who in his early years, in his, in his 30s, uh, when he was an apostle for the church, went on a, a journey around the world after World War I, checking in on all the different branches of the church. And, and one of his stopovers was here in Laie, Hawaii. And there he had a vision about building the school that would bring together people from all over the world uh, to be influences towards the establishment of peace internationally. And that was, that was in the 1920s. The, the, the school didn't get built until 1955. And uh, when he became the, the prophet of the church. And his vision was always that this was going to be a very unique place. It wasn't just a church school, but it was a gathering of all these people from all these different countries. And I, I graduated from here. I was deeply moved by that. It actually was the impetus for me to get into peace building and studying conflict resolution in graduate school. I was, I was deeply interested in what he saw and then trying to figure out how to do it. And then came back here in 2005 to start a program around conflict resolution and now we have a major and a certificate program and and it's where I, I don't want to diminish my draft stuff but the, the draft stuff really is my side my side gig my side hustle I, this is by far the the biggest amount of my time is spent working here at BYU Hawaii working with our students and then working on projects around the world well and you, you may have just answered that with you know considering the NBA draft stuff your your, your side hustle how they're, they, you don't necessarily think that they, the same person would be doing both. How do you, how do you balance the two? Because like you said, there are a lot of people that just know you from your NBA draft stuff and have no clue about the other side and the majority of your professional career. Yeah, it, it's, an, it's an interesting balance in, in many ways. You know, I, after I left BYU Hawaii, I went to grad school to study conflict resolution but while I was in school struggling to make ends meet, I had a uh, wife and two young kids uh, at the time. I was trying to figure out how to make money. And I ended up starting a website with another BYU Hawaii graduate, Jason Peary, uh, who, I'd, who I'd gone to school with. So it ended up being nbatalk.com and then sportstalk.com. And that got super popular right when I was graduating from law school and getting a master's in conflict resolution. At the same time, we ended up selling it to ESPN right around that same time. And as part of that deal, I went to ESPN to help integrate my company 
uh, into theirs, which actually became Insider for ESPN.com. And then from 2001 to about 2005, that, you know, that was my full-time job. I was covering the NBA, the NBA draft, you know, doing it all. I was living right there in Bristol, Connecticut. But there was a big part of me that was deeply unfulfilled because I'd actually studied and actually felt really like my, my life journey, my vocation in life was actually doing conflict resolution. But I loved the MBA so much. And I mean, enjoyed what I was doing so much. It was really hard to pry yourself away from that and do something different. But I, it was actually a trip to Africa with the Kembe Mutombo that, um, and, and spending a, a week with him that re- and we just had a lot of long conversations that actually just got me saying, you know what, it's, it's time to make a change. I didn't know what I was going to do. I actually told ESPN before I even knew about BYU Hawaii that I was, I was going to leave ESPN and I was going to go back and pursue conflict resolution. BYU Hawaii called a few weeks later. I, I left here. And then, about a, and then about eight months after that, ESPN called again while I was in Light EA and said, hey, would you still be interested in doing the draft? We, we think you could do that. It worked with the academic schedule here at BYU Hawaii that I could take the, the summers off and, and do that. And, and I, of course, I, I still loved it and wanted to do it. And so that's, that's how that all came into being. And then interestingly enough, my biggest conflict resolution project that I've worked on for the last 15 years is with a nonprofit called Peace Players that uses the game of basketball to bring Israelis and Palestinians or Protestants and Catholics in Northern Ireland, um, blacks and whites in South Africa, Greeks and Turks in, in Cyprus and, and lately in the United States and a number of different places. And so I found a way actually personally to combine that love of basketball with conflict resolution as well. And, and far from being just a sort of gimmick sort of thing, there's just a ton of research that actually when you take people and put them in situations like sports, stereotypes drop, they're able to work together and collaborate together. And it actually can be a really powerful impetus for them to actually start problem solving on the bigger issues that they face in life. And so that's been a huge, huge part of my life. I've been to the Israel 50 times uh, plus working on projects there. And, um, and so it, it all is somewhat integrated in my life in a way that I know from the outside, it's really hard uh, to see or understand. You referenced uh, the, the, the early websites and the, the internet was barely a thing at that time. Can you take us back to those early days when you were just kind of feeling your way, dipping your toe, and yet at the start of something that became pretty huge pretty quickly? Yeah. So uh, my friend, Jason Peary, who really had the idea, I, mean, I want to give him the credit. He, we were talking one night and I was trying to figure out, I'm going to work at a gas station. I mean, what am I going to do? I, I was getting killed in law school. I was at Georgetown Law School. It was, it was burying me alive. And he's like, you know, what if there was something, maybe many of uh, the, the listeners here would know the Dredge Report, but the Dredge Report had like, it was a conservative website, had a lot of political stories on it, and they were just links. He's like, what if we did that for every sports team? And it was just a one-stop shop. You could go there. You could, you know, if you're a jazz fan, here's everything that was written about the jazz in every newspaper around the country today about that. And you could just consume all of that in one place. And that was the original idea. I thought it was a really good idea. I thought I would use it. I would, I would read it. He did as well. And, and while these, these services are much more popular today, they were really sort of non-existent outside of like what the Drudge Report was doing. The idea of, and, of being an aggregator, right? Yeah, an aggregator of, of yeah. links. And so I actually went to the library, got an HTML for Dummies book, actually just ended up writing the code for the website and without any sort of background. And if you've seen the Drudge Report, it's very low tech and ours was maybe even more low tech than that. And it didn't do much for a while until uh, it was around Super Bowl time. And I, I can't remember whether it was Time or Newsweek. I can't remember anymore. One of those major magazines, uh, one of the writers was talking about, hey, if you want to catch up on the Super Bowl, here's my favorite websites and, and listed ours as one of his like five favorite websites. We didn't know that was coming. All we knew is our servers just crashed uh, the next day. And it took us a while to figure it out. And after that, it just grew exponentially. It, uh, by the time we... Uh, sold to ESPN. I think we were one of the top five most trafficked uh, sports websites on the on the internet, despite the fact that it was two guys running it out of our basement and a bunch of freelancers on the side. I mean, that was the extent of our of our company. And I'm not just saying this because we're talking to you, but I always felt and I still feel that in terms of the NBA draft insiders, I always thought you were the preeminent guy. I love the information. 
I loved you on ESPN. And, and you and I have, have talked. I used to have you when, when I used to be a, a sports radio producer. I'd have you on our shows all the time to talk jazz and then big picture NBA. But then there came a time two years ago where you left ESPN. You had a two-year no-compete. So you still may have had information, but you didn't have an outlet for it. Now that's changed. You're back. You've got a brand new podcast, uh, the uh, Chad Ford's NBA Big Board. By the way, I'm a big fan. I listen to it every day. You've got great guests. You, you kind of do some redrafting with some people. How did that new venture uh, come into your lap? Well, it was a, it was a long and painful hiatus uh, leaving ESPN. I, I was there for, I believe, 17 years uh, they had a round of layoffs uh, that the company had. Myself, Mark Stein, some of my you know closest friends. We were we were all laid off, but we were also under contract. And ESPN decided that they were going to enforce the non compete as part of that. And uh, it just left myself, especially, without much to do for the next two years. And you know, I spent that time actually most of it writing a book, not about the MBA, but about conflict resolution, something that I'd always really wanted to work on. And, and many of my people on that side of my life had been encouraged me to do that. I just didn't have time. Given everything that I was doing at the university and all the stuff with the MBA, I just didn't have time. So in, in a large part, I set a lot of stuff aside. I just set it aside. I enjoyed college basketball as a fan. Uh, I enjoyed the MBA as a fan. I still talk to my friends in the MBA but I really wasn't worried about doing rankings or anything else like that. I knew I had a couple of years out. And, and, and then as things began to get closer to what did I want to do next, my life had fundamentally changed in some ways. And I knew I didn't want to be the breaking news guy anymore. I, I kind of moved past that in my life. But I felt like I had a lot of insight into both what had happened in past drafts as well as how to continue to scout. And I still had all of those connections in the NBA. And one thing I think that was unique about my coverage covering the draft was that a lot of the coverage is, okay, here's my personal opinion about how everybody should go in the draft. And my approach is all, was more of a reporter talking to the NBA scouts, talking to the general managers, trying to get a consensus around where they thought things were going to go part because they're the professionals. They spend every front office spends millions of dollars doing this. That's, that's the first thing. And the second thing is there's, there is wisdom in crowds that instead of one person's opinion, hearing 15, 20 scouts talk about different things, you, the patterns begin to emerge. And, and I always thought that that was a big part of the service that I gave at, at ESPN. While I certainly had personal opinions and I did scout as well, and occasionally I'd stick my thumb on the, on, on the scale, it really was about what I what I thought was reflective of the NBA and, and a lot of NBA teams told me they missed that. And so, you know, that's going to be a big part of the podcast. So uh, half of the podcast is going to be keeping up with the current draft, little tough this year that we don't even know when the draft is going to be. NBA teams are pushing to push it back into August, late summer, maybe even early fall. And while balancing that out, uh, going back and looking at past drafts, what happened and why I've been partnering with John Hollinger uh, who worked in the front office for the Memphis Grizzlies uh, for, the, for seven years and before that was a colleague at ESPN. And then I'm going to do a series of draft master classes, which haven't dropped yet, talking to NBA general managers, scouts, uh, trainers, uh, people that have done uh, the psychology of players in the draft, just to give people a 360 view of like what it really takes to find that next great prospect and, and allow people to really hear from experts in ways that I don't think they normally get to hear. And so that, that, that's coming as well. Uh, th those podcasts will start dropping soon as well. And, and maybe that's the professor in me that really wants to, to also educate people about what really goes on in, in selecting someone uh, in the draft. So as you say, we don't know when, but at some point we're going to have an NBA draft. When it occurs, BYU will have one guy on the radar, and that's Yoli Childs. How is he set up right now? He's a potential second round pick probably right now. I, it, I did some research. I knew I was coming on here. I talked to some of the teams uh, about him. Obviously he's an elite rebounder. He's got great length for his size. He's been super, super productive the last two years at BYU, both as a scorer and as a rebounder. There are some issues with him as an NBA, with an NBA prospect that uh, as you look at bigs and how they've evolved in the NBA guys that can stretch the floor 
Now I know he actually shot, uh, man, I think it was like 48% from three there, but there's questions about how legitimate that shot is at the NBA level. And one of the things that NBA teams look at very carefully is your free throw percentage, that there seems to be a direct correlation between free throw shooting and translation of three point shot to the NBA. That's been a much shakier proposition uh, for Childs, the, at least the, the last few years. And, and then the other thing is uh, defensively, can you both guard in the paint, but also given that the number of bigs that are in the league are stretching the floor more and more, that's something that bigs are going to do. Do you have the lateral quickness and foot speed to also get out and, and guard people on the perimeter now because bigs are just asked to do that more and more in the league? And I think there's some question marks about how that's going to go. The energy, the passion that he plays, plays with, uh, Montrez Harrell is a, is a comp that you hear a lot who's actually had a very successful year uh, last few years at, at, with the Clippers that had many of those same concerns about his game coming into the draft. That's a, probably a super positive comp for him. If that's the case, if he's that guy, he should be in the lottery in this year's draft. And that's not where I'm hearing teams focus with him on right now, though. Chad, in general, how are players from BYU viewed in the NBA? And maybe not even just the NBA, even overseas or, or the G League where guys like, you know, TJ Hawes or, or Jake Toulson, guys like that may be looked at. In general, how, how is BYU viewed in the professional ranks? I know this is hard for BYU fans to hear, but I don't actually think teams or scouts really care. I know there's this always this, this undercurrent of old Duke guys or Kentucky guys or UCLA guys or BYU guys because we put so much investment and identity into our schools and our alumni and, and what that means. And, and I especially think for BYU fans, it's, there's a certain validation when a BYU player makes, makes it big, right? There's something that's validating about it. But to be honest, it's the same with like Jimmer Fredette for a minute. You know, nobody cared whether Jimmer Fredette played at BYU or whether he'd played at Kentucky or anything else. They, they want to find out, can he play in the NBA? That's, that's, the, that's the question. And there's very few teams or scouts that I ever talk to that anything that they're talking about in their scouting report has anything to do with BYU or the system or anything like that. Now, sometimes level of competition plays a role and being able to see prospects play against other elite prospects. But BYU is in a division that's, that's, that's good enough. It has Gonzaga, which every year is, is obviously one of the top teams in the country to, to play against every night. And so as much as I've heard this my whole life, oh, there's there a stigma about BYU players this way, that way, or the other? The answer is, is so much simpler than that. They just want to know whether they can play in the NBA. And BYU, at least recently, hasn't really produced. They've been good teams and good players, but haven't really produced that level of caliber of prospect. So you bring up Jimmer, and you had Bill Simmons on your podcast, um, and, and you guys were talking hits and misses, and, and, and Bill actually acknowledged Jimmer's a guy he kind of missed on. Not that he Me thought too. he was going to be an MVP, but he thought he'd be better than he, than he turned out being. From your right. perspective, uh, why did what happened with Jimmer in college never really translate at the next level in the NBA, despite the fact he was a lottery pick? Well, that unlimited shooting range and his green light mentality in shooting it, we actually thought if nothing else – he was going to be a guy that could come off the bench and be a bit of a microwave type of scorer. Uh, that, that at least was something that we thought maybe like Lou Williams or something like that coming into the NBA. And maybe his upside would be an elite shooter that could start in the league like a JJ Redick, for example. I mean, that's, that's, that's where teams were looking at him. And I think this is where, and this is a really hard part about evaluating the draft. You're evaluating a player in a vacuum. The one thing I can't evaluate before the draft is where they're going to land, what their opportunity is going to be, what's the, what's the system that they're going to fit into, and whether that's going to be a good fit for the player. Now, you'd think teams would know that, and teams would draft accordingly, but right. teams don't. For a lot of reasons, general managers and coaches don't communicate particularly well on a lot of teams. Mm. And so a general manager can fall in love with a player, for example, and it's not at all a player that the coach wants or thinks is going to be a great fit in the system. This happened with Jimmer in Sacramento. I think there was an immediate disconnect between the front office and the coaching staff about Jimmer and, and the role that he would play and how he fit into the system. 
And, and this is the case with all but the most elite prospects in the NBA. Fit matters, and it matters dramatically in your career. And because there's so many new prospects rolling into the NBA every year, if you don't make that splash in year one or two, it is really, really hard to get that second chance to really come back and, and make a difference. And so I, I tell young players all the time, I actually had several conversations with Jim before the draft, everybody's obsessed with how high they go in the draft and want to go as high as possible. That is not the right calculation. You should be obsessed with where's a team where I can get playing time. Where's a team that has a coach that has a philosophy that would fit my strengths and what I do as a player. And, and I wouldn't even work out for teams that were, that were any different, but that's not how he approached it and not how a lot of players frankly approach it. And I think it burned him, you know, like for example, Draymond Green, for the Golden State Warriors, there's probably 20 teams in the NBA where I'm not sure Draymond Green is in the league after two or three years because of the unique nature of his game. He landed on the absolute perfect team for him with the Warriors and became a star, right? And I'm not, I don't know that Jimmer would have been a star on, on the right team, but if you look at like a Mike D'Antoni – Houston Rockets launch up 53s a game type of team, and there had been a need for a player like Jimmer Fredette on that team, I think we would be talking differently about his career because I think he proved when he went overseas he could still play the game, he could still score. He's a competitive player. It's so hard once you're overseas to come back into the league and break into the league. It's just almost impossible, even when you're having great, great seasons abroad and and unfortunately for Jimmer, he could just never break his way back in. Well, on, on fit being everything, I mean, Kawhi's in the same draft, right, as, as Jimmer and lands in the perfect spot. Lands in the perfect spot for him in San Antonio. Now, I, I tend to believe that he dropped way too far in the draft and that, that Leonard was a guy who probably figures it out anywhere. But it, with that said, San Antonio was the perfect spot for him to develop as a player and I think <clears throat> helped absolutely him become – uh, an, an MVP type caliber prospect in the league. Staying with that same interview on your podcast that you had with Bill Simmons, you guys were talking about guys, you know, hits and misses and, and guys that maybe uh, did better than you expected. And Donovan Mitchell was one of the guys that you brought up that you thought he would be good, but you didn't necessarily see this type, especially this early in his career, not specifically with Donovan, but with players like that, is there a common denominator in why some guys succeed, and maybe it's maybe the answer is fit, but is there a common denominator as to why guys sometimes exceed what their expectations were? Work ethic, uh, chip on your shoulder, wanting to prove that people got it really, really wrong about you. And, you know, the other thing about Donovan Mitchell and one of the things that attracted the Jazz to him, all of those things attracted the Jazz to him, also just a very high character individual. He was a guy that was going to fit from a chemistry standpoint and the culture that the Jazz had put in place. And that was part of the attraction. But the Jazz desperately needed a player like Donovan Mitchell that could go out and create his own shot off the dribble. That was a big, big missing piece for them. And I think they saw that potential there. I think the Jazz would even tell you they were surprised at how quickly he realized the potential. But by training camp, they were already telling me, uh, wow, this kid's going to be going to be special. We were excited about him on draft night, but we're more excited about him in training camp. That's a really important sign because what you'll often hear the other way is that a lot of teams actually from draft to training camp have figured out they've made a mistake. Huh. It's, it's fascinating. Just in that short amount of time, they can figure that out and then they'll start offering all sorts of excuses or they'll start hedging and start talking about let's lower expectations, lower expectations. It was not that way at all for the Jazz. They were actually raising expectations after, see, after just getting a look at Donovan Mitchell up close and really being able to spend some, some quality time with him about what he was going to be. And, and Rudy, by the way, exactly the same, the same thing. The, the, the Jazz were high-fiving all over the board when they got Rudy on draft night. And you know, interestingly, early in the season, he was a top-five pick on our board. And he struggled in France that year. He didn't progress the way that we thought he would. Then came to Chicago, really struggled in the draft combine there to the point that I, I think he just torpedoed his stock and then, had, and then struggled in several workouts after that. He was, 
acclimating himself to the U.S., to all of the stuff that was happening around him. It took him a while to, to reorient himself, but the, by the time he worked out for the Jazz, he had done that. He had a stellar workout for Utah, and they were like, man, people missed on him big time. That's what they were telling me on draft night, and of course, they turned out to be 100% right. And one of the great things you can say about the Jazz and their culture is that most of the teams that have two elite players on their roster got those in the top five picks in the draft. That's where the elite players typically lie. And they're the only team in the league that got those picks with, uh, what, 14 and 27? 13 and 27. 13 and 27. Yeah. So now this is the million-dollar question. And actually, Chad, in this scenario, it's probably the billion-dollar question. As you're talking to guys around the league, do you believe we are going to see the NBA come back this season? I don't think anybody knows. They want it bad. The league wants it bad for financial reasons, for legacy reasons, for finishing the season. Teams, obviously, especially teams like the Jazz that had a real shot this year at competing for an NBA championship, they desperately all want it. It's just so hard to predict. They're not pandemic experts, and even the pandemic experts are not all in consensus about how do we lift this shelter in place in a way to get our economy going? And you, we're watching China right now and seeing that as far as launching basketball again or launching sports, it's been harder than they thought. And so the dream is there. I think they can push the season back into August, even if they have to. Uh, there's been a, a big movement in the NBA, actually, to have the season start in December every year. And there's just been inertia and tradition, lots of things that push it back. This is actually the awesome opportunity to have like the playoffs in August, maybe the finals in September, have October and November off and start training camp in early December and start the season around the Christmas season. I I actually think there's many, many NBA owners and general managers that are hoping that's exactly what happens here. And it, it resets the NBA in a different way. But to do that, we have to get the pandemic under control And I certainly don't think if there are games and if there are playoffs this year that there'll be fans in the stand. I think that's probably a a complete no-go. This will be players playing in an empty gym in a tournament, maybe like March Madness in that, not the tournament style, but uh, everybody playing on the same court uh, where they can can control the external environment better uh, for those players and keep them safe. Chad, you talked at the start about uh, some of your worldwide travels, whether for education or professional career or sports you really have been a lot of places favorite place or places you've either visited or lived i i love jerusalem it is a not only for the the history geek in me that goes back and sees this this place that is thousands and thousands and thousands of years old with all these monumental things but as a person of faith One of the things that touches me a lot when I go to Jerusalem is that you have Jews, Muslims, Christians of all different sorts of denominations who feel something very deeply when they're there at the city. Some people that have saved up their entire lives to just for a moment stand in a place where historical events happen that are deeply meaningful to their faith. And I'm always touched when I'm there at the passion that people bring, the tears that come, the, the spirit that's there. And, you know, Jerusalem, you know, Jerusalem, Salem, is, it's, it's peace. It's the city of peace, but it's never seen peace. And, and it's partly why I've, I've worked in that spot for so many years. They, they, these people that I work with, they're incredible. The Israelis and Palestinians and, and sometimes the Christians that also I work with there, they, these are incredible, incredible people that through a number of circumstances, both historical and current, have struggled to be able to see each other and connect each other in big ways. But when they're in that old city, it is amazing that they hold that in common, the sacredness of the city, even though for different reasons, they hold that in common and it moves them in a powerful way. And and how how do we do it there? If we can do it there, I think we can do it anywhere, right? And so that's the place I love to go, not to mention the food is great, the culture is, is just amazing. If you haven't been to Jerusalem, it's, it's great. But don't take a tour of us there. I mean, that's the thing that I always say. Like, just go and wander through the city and, and talk to people. So many people speak English there. It's, it's, a, 
it's such an educational event uh, to do it that way. Um, so that's my favorite place. I, and, and look, I really love being in Hawaii. Hawaii also is just a special, special place. And every time I come home here, the smile gets on my face and, mm-hmm. and it's just an awesome place to raise your kids and, and live. You have written a book and it's called Dangerous Love. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's out very soon. It, it, June, is, is we still looking Correct. for a yeah, June. release date? Yes. Okay, uh, a little bit about, uh, and the title's intriguing enough and it, and, it, and it merits an explanation that really speaks to really kind of your life's work. Yeah, I, I just gave a TED Talk about it the other day and, and I almost wish that I'd done the TED Talk first because you don't have to com- com- condense everything into 15 minutes. And, and I wish I'd almost done that and then condensed this in the book. I actually ended up telling the story in the TED Talk that I didn't even tell in the book trying to describe dangerous love in a, in a really compact way. But my work with the Palestinians and Israelis have inspired a lot of this because it is dangerous to connect to the other side. It feels like this conflict has caused pain and suffering for me. It feels like if I connect to this person, I'm putting myself in a vulnerable state that they'll take advantage of me, that they'll hurt me or what have you. To the point that when we were working with young Israelis and Palestinians, and we would try to get them together on the basketball court. The first time that, that maybe a group of Palestinians were going to an Israeli court to play basketball, they wouldn't get off the bus, they were crying. They were convinced that they would get off the bus, someone would slit their throat or arrest them or hurt them. And we'd have to coax them there. And then this uncomfortableness, like one stands on one side of the gym, another stands on the other side of the gym. Slowly they start playing basketball, Israelis only pass the Israelis, Palestinians only pass the Palestinians but that competitive nature starts to kick in and you know in basketball that you have to pass to each other and and pass to the person that has the best chance of making a shot. And when that Israeli passes to a Palestinian for a layup and as they're walking back down the court and those hands go up and there's this high five, you know that you have them. 10 minutes later, they're they're adding each other on Instagram Hmm. and, uh, you know, on Snapchat and and, and and away they go. But that, that move, that turn towards each other feels really dangerous. And so most of us don't do this in our life, right? The people that we're in conflict with, we're both afraid of conflict and we're afraid of the people that we're in conflict with. What will happen to us is the sort of question that we ask ourselves and and how other people are impacting us. And where do you get the courage to be able to turn towards people first? And that's what I'm talking about in Dangerous Love. I see another person's needs, wants, and desires so clearly that even if I disagree with them, even if I don't like them, their needs and wants and desires matter to mu- as much to me as mine own do. And because of that, I am going to work to collaborate with them to solve problems in a way that meet their needs as well as mine. That actually takes a lot of courage. And the book is really a very personal account of what it takes to, to get there. And there are a lot of stories from my personal life where I've really struggled with conflict, a lot of uh, stories from my life working as a conflict mediator out there, but it's really written you know, I, I've been saying this a lot. I wrote it for my mom. My mom w- went through so much conflict in her life. She's not very educated. Uh, and, and as I, I went through all of these graduate degrees and everything else and teaching at university, I wanted to try to figure out how do you take all these complex theories and distill them down into a way that my mom could read this book and, and be both entertained and be able to take something about it and change her life. And she got several drafts of the book before she sent it back and she could describe the whole thing to me. And then I'm like, okay, it's ready. And so as much as I know there's been some people that have been like, what, what's Chef Ford doing? And why is he doing that? And isn't he, shouldn't he be talking about the draft? <laughs> this has really been my life's work and a, a passion. And don't think because you just love the NBA or, or sports that the book isn't for you. It's for anybody that's in relationships in their life that has a relationship that they're struggling with, whether that's with a child or a parent, with a spouse, with someone in your community or someone with the organization. It is a practical, practical way to be able to change those relationships in a positive way that will bring you happiness in ways that the NBA draft, unfortunately, can't. Hmm. Dangerous Love is the book coming out in June. Chad Ford's new book coming out. I recommend people going out and grabbing that. Also, if you have not subscribed to Chad Ford's NBA Big Board podcast, I highly recommend it. As I mentioned, I am an avid listener. I love it. Chad, cannot say thank you enough for joining us today. Thank you so much for stopping by and talking, talking a lot of different topics with us today. I really enjoyed it, guys. Thanks for having me on the program.
And for our fans, this quick reminder, you can see every episode of VoiceOver with Greg and Shep on the BYU TV Sports YouTube channel. You can hear the audio version on the Behind the Mic with Greg Rubel podcast feed and on the show page at byuradio.org. Our thanks to Chad Ford. Our thanks to you for tuning in, and go Cougs.